You're listening to the voice of Russia in London. The Russian ballet is famous worldwide for its productions. Less well known is the Egyptian ballet, trained by Russian specialists during the early part of the Cold War. Earlier this year, Russian Egyptian journalist Mona Abuisa set out to find out more about it. The Order of Lenin wasn't the only thing General Gabane Abdel Nasser brought back from Moscow in 1958. While the order is in a museum, Nasser is long dead, and his MiG warplanes are rusting across Egypt, there is an art form that survived from the era of Soviet experts. The ballet in Egypt was born amid arms deals between Egypt and the USSR in the 1950s. Egypt received economic and military support from the Soviets, while the USSR extended its influence across the Middle East. Many young Egyptians studied at Soviet universities and military schools, while Soviet experts traveled to Egypt. The culture minister, Tharwat Okasha, a former officer, invited Leonid Lavrovsky, the Bolshoi's former director and Bolshoi experts, to Cairo to establish the ballet troupe and academy. I love dancing. I was feeling happy when I danced. When I was working on the role, I used to imagine it at night, how I'd do it, what I'd change in it, and what kind of costume I'd wear. I was studying everything in my head. Ali Abdel Raze is a daughter of one of the first Egyptian royal war pilots. She was about to be one of the first Egyptian ballerinas who would travel behind the Iron Curtain in 1963. The first time she saw ballet was in Paris. She was six, and after 60 years, the feeling never left her. I went to see the ballet at the opera for the first time in my life. I saw them dancing on their toes, and I was impressed. After the performance, I told him that I want those shoes. I want to do like they do. She must know that it will be a military training, said the teacher at the ballet school back in Cairo. That didn't scare Aleya. Later, she enrolled in the academy, and in 1963, Aleya and four other teenage girls and three boys were selected from the academy and sent to Bashoi Theater for a two-year program. The press wrote then, five Egyptian butterflies flew to the USSR. Our pioneers. We were pioneers. We studied there for two years. We learned a lot. We saw a lot. There was no production at the Bolshoi that we didn't see one, two, three times until we memorized them. They loved us and we loved them, despite the Iron Curtain that isolated us from the rest of the students. Aleya still keeps those umpwans in which she danced at the Bolshoi. The shoes are as old as the Egyptian ballet itself. Aleya returned to Egypt to continue her studies. In 1966, the first ballet production was staged at the Royal Opera House in Cairo, the fountain of Bakhchisarai. Aleya performed the lead role, Zarema, her favorite role to this day. The culture minister, Okasha, saw the performance. The minister saw us perform and said, it is impossible, I must speak to the president, so he comes and sees it for himself. And he did go and speak with him on the phone during the entract and said, president, I want you to come and see what our young are doing. He came next day with his wife and saw the performance. The impressed president awarded orders of merit to the soloists. Aleya's ballet awards hang on the wall across from her father's army medals. The Russian influence was strong on us. We're a Russian school. We were taught a Russian technique at the hands of the best experts. And not only did we have a strong troupe, people were talking about it. They were saying that Egypt has a strong ballet troupe. The Cairo Ballet Company was formed in the late 60s. Classics like Giselle, The Nutcracker, Don Juan, Don Quixote, Swan Lake, and others were performed by sun-kissed dancers. Tours, press, awards, Bolshoi experts. The world was at their feet. Then, one morning, 
the Royal Opera House, their home, was burned down. Some said it was a political attack on then-president Anwar Sadat. Next year, Sadat severed Soviet ties and turned to Americans. The Academy kept losing dancers without Soviet management. They fled to Germany, the USSR, and the US. Meanwhile, the Egyptians who studied at the University of Theater Arts in Moscow were literally sitting on their luggage in classes, ready to be deported at any minute. But they weren't. In the early 80s, a drop happened after the Russian experts left and the male soloists started to leave. What I want to say is that we tried to battle this drop, we tried to stay. Abdel Munam Kamil was one of those three boys who traveled to the Bolshoi in the 60s. Later, he left to Germany and Italy. He decided to finally return to Egypt during that downturn to revive the ballet. Kamel and his Italian wife and ballerina, Erminia Gambarelli, waited in empty studios, chased dancers who fled, toured around any stage in Egypt that could fit them. Aleya is still disturbed by the memory of some venues, where sewage pipes run backstage, where they had to change into their tutus. <laughs> Of course, when I came, the opera house was not existing and we were working in the Academy of Art because, as you know, the opera house has been built in 1987 and in that period the condition of ballet was very poor. The dancers were out of, of shape and many were left, boys, five, six, I am speaking about around ten people in the Cairo Ballet Company with no repertoire, with no regular classes, without any future. And little by little, the people came back until we were, I remember, 25 dancers. Now, Erminia is the artistic director of the Cairo Ballet Company. She succeeded her husband, who ascended to be artistic director of the whole opera. But back in the late 80s, they had to do sit-ins by the Ministry of Culture until they were accepted as the official opera troupe. Russians also returned to Egypt escaping inflation, the rise of criminals, and long queues after the Soviet empire collapsed in the 90s. At the opera studio is Alla Shevilov with young dancers. She battles with their pirouettes. It frustrates her that the academy didn't teach the basics properly in the first place. Back in Soviet days, Alla studied at the University of Theater Arts in Moscow with Egyptian students. After 40 years, she is reunited with some of them in Egypt. Allah traveled from Ukraine to Cairo in the mid-90s. It is related to our Ukrainian revolution. The USSR collapsed and everything caved in with it. Financing of theatres stopped, the troops scattered and nobody remained. It was difficult times and here in Egypt, by contrast, was very good. First of all, the Egyptian troop was actually very strong, primarily because of the influx from the former USSR. At that time, Kamel was our director, and he really did a lot for ballet. What persuaded me to stay is that during that period, there are a lot of my students from Odessa. All of the principal dancers of the Egyptian ballet were my former students from Odessa. Most of those Russians returned to ballet in Russia. Only a few dancers, a pianist, and Allah stayed. Unlike Erminia, who says, now is the golden age of ballet in Egypt. Other things, it was back in the 90s. Now is worse than before. The troupe is not as it used to be. There are good soloists, but the problem is the corps de ballet. This problem starts from the academy. It produces poor applicants. We can't afford to be selective. We need them, otherwise there won't be any repertoire. Ballet, it's like each day I be in stage, it's a new life for me. Says prima dancer Hani Hassan. This year, for example, I make short version of ballet Spartacus on music of Polero. It's so hard music because it's only 19 items they repeat by different instruments. I use each instrument for a new story. I was fighting with myself to make this role. Spartacus is a ballet for three acts. I using this in only 17 minutes and I make all the story in 17 minutes. 
a lot of people they say I'm crazy and I'm happy because I accept them for a lot of my doctors or my audience and crazy also can be done uh, to be creative give you became to be crazy Bijar he was crazy a lot of different choreographers was crazy why not it have one Egyptian crazy also A giant Russian matryoshka doll hangs by the entrance of the Ballet Academy. Everyone in Ballet in Egypt came from this former Soviet Egyptian establishment. During mornings, Hani Hassan pulls young boys' hair, splits their legs and arches their backs, making ballet performance out of them. Little Hani had his hair pulled too in the same studios back in the 80s. Now Hani is a celebrity prima dancer at the company who travels the world playing lead roles from Evil Rothbard to Zorba to Spartacus. I wish all this um, bad dream what we are living now is finished soon. We will not see anything after revolution, like something change, something what we was wishing to, 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 to make it when we make a revolution. But uh, Muslim brothers, they came and they stole our revolution. About my experience with Muslim brothers, I not believe them at all. I will speak about with my body to explain how we are here in unpleasant situations. Hani protests at Tahrir Square against the Muslim Brotherhood regime and back at the opera prepares for his choreographed performance, Rasputin. Hani's response to the current religious and political climate in Egypt is told through a story of an infamous holy man from the twilight of royal Russia. He will play Rasputin himself. <laughs> Tonight is the final rehearsal for Swan Lake. The swan stretch as stagehands pray in the background. The orchestra tune their instruments and Tchaikovsky melodies blast from the speakers. Outside in the city, Molotov cocktails explode and little wars rumble between the new regime and the opposition. We were all worried that with this ongoing unrest in the country, our show would be performed for an empty auditorium. But to our surprise, it was fully packed. The current rise of Islamists to power brought unofficial pressure on the ballet company. This politics, former white swan Erminia has to handle. She had to restrain their modern repertoire and revise some revealing costumes or intimate scenes in the classics. The Romeo and Juliet love scene is at risk. It frustrates her and she says, what will the audience understand then? She feels there is little or no support from the post-revolutionary culture ministers, unlike under the former minister, Farouk Hosni, who was in place for 24 years until the revolution. The minister stood by her side, but that's not Armenia's favorite topic. Of course, we have to consider that the ideology of the country has changed. And we have to, um, we are artists, we have to consider that uh, there is another type of thinking which we have to respect because after all, the Egyptian chose this kind of way to follow. So we have to consider that we are in Egypt and we have to follow the wave. So um, in my field, in my small field, because ballet is a very privileged and but small field, I was trying not to, uh, to reproduce a ballet uh, very contemporary uh, in which uh, you have to really to use the body. So we are, uh, sometimes we are using uh, salope to show the body during the work. Now I am trying to make more classics in a way that not to offend anybody. But before, under the, the previous regime, we were very free in choosing uh, different choreographers, different ballet. We were making many ballet that nowadays I, I prefer to leave for a period. Then we will see. While Fiery Hani throws down the gauntlet to the new regime right on stage, Erminia takes on some battles with diplomacy. Others she just watches and waits. Hey, one, two, three. We are not offending anybody, just doing our work for which we are suffering, you know, ballet, how much is difficult. We are uh, rehearsing usually from five to four weeks for the cracker. 
every day, means uh, around 40 days each year to produce a uh, um, nutcracker. It will be really a pity to throw all this work of 85 people that are working daily. And we know that there are martyrs, that are people that really gave, give their life for a better country. But art, in my opinion, is always art. You cannot say, I will not uh, show a concert because they die. On the contrary, this is our way to say we are with you. Our work is uh, given to these people that we will never forget. Backstage, white swans grab the first piece of furniture they find. They gape for air. Their thoraxes expand and contract frantically. Sweat runs down their faces. On stage, a love tragedy from 19th century Russia unravels. Tamil is watching. This performance will be his last. He will die of a heart attack a week from now. The opera will host his public funeral. Many will attend from politicians and celebrities to guards and tea makers. His dancers will reach to carry his coffin wrapped in the Egyptian flag. The opera will stand still for three days. Then everybody will return to work and studios will smell of sweat again. As the dancers say, ballet is not about beautiful tutus. That was Mona Abuisa reporting from Cairo on the Egyptian ballet. This is the voice of Russia in London.